There we go. Okay, excellent. Now it looks okay now? Perfect. Great. Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. So let's go ahead and get started talking about genomic testing for breast cancer. Um, I do have a couple of disclosures. Um, I work in this space, and so I have um, ties with various different sequencing companies. Um, I am also going to be talking about some non-FDA approved, but NCCN guideline endorsed uses of some of these tests. Um, so what I was hoping to go through today, I'll go through the different types of genetic testing. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between germline and somatic or tumor testing, because I think this is an area that is confusing for people, and I think it's important to try to understand. Um, I'll go through the clinical scenarios of who can benefit from testing and the different types of testing. Um, I'll go through some caveats and considerations uh, when you're thinking about testing. I'm going to briefly outline the currently approved targeted therapies for breast cancer. There's many more that are on the horizon, but um, I won't be getting into those. And then I will talk also about some new technologies that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so first and foremost, I wanted to talk about the difference between germline genetic testing and somatic testing. So starting first with germline testing. Um, so this is kind of what people, I think, classically think of when they think about genetic testing for cancer. So this is to determine if you have in inherited a mutation that increases your risk for developing breast cancer. So this doesn't guarantee that you're going to develop breast cancer, but may help explain um, why you developed breast cancer. This is usually something that runs in families. Um, common examples of these kinds of mutations are BRCA1 or BRCA2. These mutations are things that you inherited from your parents, and they're present in all of the cells of your body, um, and they increase your risk um, for different types of cancer, depending on the specific mutation. Um, when people are having germline testing done, it's usually done as a cheek swab, which is called a, a buckle swab. That's what's shown in the upper picture, um, but can also be done as a blood draw. Um, and some commercial vendors that commonly do this, so sometimes people don't know what the testing is, but they remember what company did it. Um, and so Invite is a company that does this, Color is another company, Ambry Genetics, um, and there are, I'm sure, others. So that's germline testing. In contrast, we have somatic testing or, or tumor testing. So in this type of testing, we're looking for mutations in the tumor, and these are changes um, that are part of what turn the normal cells into cancer cells, right? So you have your normal breast tissue cells, and at some point along the line, those cells changed from being normal cells into cancer cells. And part of what caused that to change was mutations in the tumor's DNA. Um, and so this is what we're looking for with somatic mutations. It's important to point out that when we're doing tumor tissue sequencing, we can also detect mutations that turn out to be germline, because um, I mentioned before that um, germline mutations are in every cell in your body, so this is going to include cancer cells. Um, but for the most part, what we're looking for is tumor-specific um, mutations. Um, so this testing is done usually on the tumor specimen itself. So typically patients, after they've already had their biopsy, they have their diagnosis, they don't have to do anything else. Their um, provider will get in touch with the pathology lab and ask the pathology lab either to do the tumor tissue sequencing in-house or send it out to a commercial company. Um, if there isn't a good um, uh, specimen of tissue uh, to use for this kind of somatic testing, then they may uh, request doing something called a liquid biopsy, which is a blood test. And I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, so I just wanted to, to show this slide just to sort of, again, kind of hammer home the differences between germline and somatic testing. Um, so germline mutations, these are present in the, the egg and sperm when you're first uh, being uh, created, um, and then they're present in every cell in the body, uh, and they can be passed on to your offspring. So germline mutations are important for um, considerations for things for your family, for your children. In contrast, somatic mutations or tumor mutations, these were not things that you inherited from your baby, um, or, or not things that you inherited when you were a baby, um, but instead um, happened some point along the line when your tissues were developing. It may have happened many years ago. It could have happened more recently. 
and it's specific just to those cells, so just to those cancer cells. Um, and these variations are not passed on to children. Um, so again, just looking at this comparison, so germline mutations, these increase your risk for developing cancer, but again, they don't guarantee that you will get cancer. In contrast, somatic mutations, these are the mutations that turned normal cells into the cancer cells. Um, germline mutations are present in all the cells of your body. That's part of why you can look for them with things like cheek swabs that are just looking at the cells of your inner cheek. Um, in contrast, somatic mutations are only present in the cancer cells. Um, germline mutations may be present in other blood relatives. You inherited this from somebody and you can pass it on to your children. And this is really important when you're thinking about testing because your testing results from your germline um, testing it doesn't just impact you. Um, this may also have um, uh, implications for your other relatives. Um, they may need to get tested um, and they may, oh goodness, I'm sorry, are you guys seeing this update? I'm sorry, I don't know if I can turn this off. Um, all right, I'm just gonna keep going. Move it down. Um, Uh, it may also have impact for your relatives. So, um, you know, thinking about uh, if your relatives would want to get tested and it may impact them in terms of thinking about cancer screening. Uh, in contrast, um, somatic mutations are not inherited and they're not passed down. Um, when we think about screening, so people who are known to have a germline mutation that puts them at increased risk for cancer may benefit from increased screening. And again, this depends on the type of mutation they have and what cancers that mutation is associated with. Um, common mutations associated with um, breast cancer, so BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, um, people who are carriers of those mutations who don't yet have cancer may benefit from increased screening. So starting mammograms at an earlier age, potentially incorporating breast MRI as well. Um, there's no somatic, you know, these are people who already have cancer. It doesn't affect the other cells in their tissue. And so this doesn't necessarily have an impact on screening for them. Um, but both of these are important because they both do have targeted treatment options. So that's something that we're going to talk a little bit more about as well. Um, and um, okay, sorry about that. Um, so I wanted to, I said I was going to come back a little bit more to liquid biopsy, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So this is a special type of somatic testing. Um, here we are looking for tumor mutations, but we're looking for it in the blood. So in your blood, you have free-floating fragments of DNA that comes from your normal tissues, but also comes from the cancer tissues. And so we can look through uh, if we sequence those free-floating fragments of DNA, we can look for mutations in them um, and then identify mutations that could be coming from the cancer. There's other um, things to look at as ter in terms of liquid biopsy other than just this uh, cell-free DNA. You can also look for things like circulating tumor cells, um, and then there's some other things that are coming down the horizon. I think um, right now, most of the technology is focused on cell-free DNA. That seems to be where most of the, uh, most of the impact is. Um, Right now, liquid biopsy is not being currently used to diagnose cancer. It's being used once people already have a cancer diagnosis, um, but it can be used for things like finding tumor mutations for a targeted therapy. So for example, if you have metastatic breast cancer and you wanna know if you have um, your cancer has a mutation that would benefit from a particular therapy type, then this might be a good option. Um, and then tracking to see if cancer comes back. So this is something that has not is not really fully developed in breast cancer yet, but is um, more developed in colon cancer. Um, so there's the Signatera um, test, which is for patients who've had early stage colon cancer, who've undergone surgery and then are undergoing monitoring. So in addition to their scans, they can also get these uh, Signatera liquid biopsy tests um, to help give an early prediction of if their cancer is going to come back. Um, People are working on this kind of technology in breast, and I think actually it is commercially available, but I think the use of this is not as well defined in breast cancer as it is in colon cancer. 
Um, so thinking about who can benefit from testing. Um, so I want to focus first on germline testing. Uh, so here are the NCCN, that's the National Comprehensive Cancer Center um, Network, uh, guidelines for germline testing. Um, so I think there are a lot of people who would say anybody who is diagnosed with breast cancer would benefit um, from germline testing. Um, but in terms of getting things approved by the insurance company, these are the guidelines that they follow. Um, so I think very relevant for this group, so breast cancer diagnosed before age 50. So regardless of the cancer type, anyone who's diagnosed with breast cancer before age 50. Um, and then regardless of age, anyone who's diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, um, with multiple breast cancers, any men diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, if you have a lobular breast cancer, which is a particular subtype of breast cancer with either a personal or a family history of gastric cancer, that's because there's a particular genetic syndrome that goes with lobular breast cancer and gastric cancer. Anyone of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, so these are there are specific founder mutations in that patient, uh, in that population that um, are increasing risk for um, breast cancer, specifically um, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And then when you look at your family history, um, that can also uh, provide an indication for getting germline testing. So if you have one or more close blood relative who had breast cancer before the age of 50, a male relative with breast cancer, anyone who had ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, or metastatic prostate cancer, um, then that would be an indication for germline testing. Or if you've had more, uh, two or more close blood relatives with either breast or prostate cancer. Um, so you see a lot of people will meet these guidelines for germline testing. So we end up saying that almost everybody um, with breast cancer has an indication for germline testing. Does germline testing need to be repeated? So this is a question that comes up fairly often. Let's say, you know, you got diagnosed with breast cancer in 2008 um, and you were under age 50 at that time and you had germline testing done and now it's, you know, 15 years later and you've had a recurrence. Do you need to repeat your germline testing? Um, well, so this is, this is a, a question that has a lot of caveats to it. So inherited mutations do not change. So the, the mutations that you got from your, from your parents, those are the same. So those aren't going to change over time. Um, but importantly, the tests change. Uh, so and, and the test only tests what it's testing for, right? So some of the earlier um, tests were only looking for one or two specific mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, because that's what we knew about at the time. As we learn more and more about different mutations that increase people's risk for developing cancer, these panels become bigger and bigger. Um, and so it's possible that you had a test in 2008 that was only looking for two or three specific mutations and you didn't have any of those mutations. But if you were to repeat testing now with a much larger panel of tests, you still wouldn't have one of those two or three that were tested before, but you may have some of the other mutations that are now detected on the new panels. Um, so in that case, we do recommend repeating testing. So typically, and this is a little bit insurance company dependent, but typically if it's been greater than 10 years since testing was done, um, it may be worth repeating uh, the testing again um, with a, a larger panel, especially if you have a strong family history or if you're meeting the other criteria for, for testing. Um, what about somatic testing? So who can benefit from somatic testing? Um, so right now we're doing the tumor somatic testing primarily for patients with metastatic breast cancer, and that's because this is the setting where most of these targeted therapies are approved. Um, so I would recommend that every patient with metastatic breast cancer have somatic testing at least once um, to look for some of these targeted therapies. Um, the thing that is uh, important to consider, though, is that um, unlike germline testing, where the mutations do not change, um, mutations in the tumor can actually change over time. And sometimes they change over time in response to treatment. Um, so an example of this, 
um, is, you know, initially a breast cancer may not have an ESR1 mutation, um, but then while patients are treated over time with an aromatase inhibitor and or a CD and a CDK4-6 inhibitor, so something like, you know, anastrozole and ribocyclob, um, then that cancer can actually develop a mutation in the estrogen receptor called an ESR1 mutation. And initially that's present in only just a few of the cancer cells, but over time can become present in more and more of the cancer cells until you have a cancer that has a lot of ESR1 mutations. Um, and so this may be different if you did sequencing of the tumor at a later date compared to at an earlier date. And so while we say that, um, you know, at least once it should be done for metastatic cancer, but I think it's helpful to sequence patients with metastatic breast cancer more frequently, um, potentially uh, at times when they're becoming resistant to their current therapy, because this may identify new mutations. Um, and I think this is really a great place for the role of liquid biopsy, because you don't necessarily want to be putting patients through repeated tissue biopsies over and over again, but this is a, a good opportunity for liquid biopsy. Okay, so some genetic testing caveats. I went through all of that, but some things that people sometimes get hung up on that I just kind of wanted to, to talk through. Um, so the first one is about germline mutations. So germline mutations do not guarantee that a patient will get cancer. So I think this is something that is sometimes very stressful for people. Um, they, you know, get this testing back. They think, oh my gosh, I'm guaranteed to get cancer. Or if I have my child tested, then that means that they're guaranteed to get cancer. It's not a guarantee. It's an increased risk of cancer, but some people will never get the cancer. So I just wanted to show this um, nice graphic um, from uh, the National Cancer Institute, um, which shows, you know, for patients who have mutated BRCA1 mutations, between 55 and 60% of patients will get breast cancer in their lifetime. But that means, you know, four out of 10 people will not. Um, similarly, with mutated BRCA2, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is about 45%. Um, so again, you know, at least five of these people out of 10 will not develop cancer. Um, another genetic testing caveat, and I've mentioned this before, but that the test only tests what it tests. <laughs> um, so these are our panel testing for the most part, meaning it's not looking at every gene in your entire genome. It's looking at a specific list of genes. And so if what you're looking for is not on that panel, then the fact that it doesn't find it doesn't mean anything because it wasn't looking for it. Um, so an example here, this is a, a different panels that you can order um, from a genetic testing provider. And then going down the side here is the specific gene. So you can see this comprehensive hereditary cancer panel, this covers all of these different genes. But you see some of these other panels that are smaller, for example, the hereditary breast cancer panel is not covering a lot of these genes. It's only covering some of them. Um, so when you're comparing uh, results, um, you know, if you have results done at different times, or if you're comparing germline testing results to somatic testing results, and you're looking to say like, oh, you know, is this mutation in both places? You really need to make sure that the panels were looking at the same thing, because the things can be missing and it may be that it wasn't there, or it may be that it just wasn't included on the panel. Um, that next caveat sort of ties in very closely to this, which is that the knowledge about genetics is constantly changing and the testing that we're doing is also constantly changing. So the original panels that were done 10, 15 years ago were, you know, three or four specific mutations. Now we're doing 500 genes where we're covering not just specific mutations, but the entire gene. Um, so, you know, we're getting a lot more information now. What that means, though, is that we have a lot more things that are called variants of uncertain significance. So these are mutations in genes that we think are associated with cancer, um, but we don't know what the impact is of that specific mutation. So is that mutation changing that gene in a way that's going to make it cancerous or not? Um, Sometimes we don't know. Uh, you know, some mutations have been very well characterized and are well known to be either associated with cancer in the germline setting or causative of cancer in the somatic setting. 
Others are well studied and are known to not be related, that this is just part of normal human variation. And this mutation doesn't increase your risk of cancer at all. Um, and so, you know, there are mutations that are well classified into those two categories, but there's a whole much more lump of mutations that are in this middle ground of unknown significance, which really just means that it hasn't been studied um, sufficiently to know. Um, and so if you have this testing, it's possible that something will be classified as unknown significance at the time, um, and then later may become, you know, classified either as benign, meaning not associated, or pathogenic, meaning, you know, associated with the cancer as we get more information. Uh, and that sort of brings me also ties into this last uh, caveat, which is that not all mutations in a given gene are the same. So we say, you know, BRCA1, that's the name of the gene, but there are specific mutations, so specific changes in the genetic code of that gene um, that are the ones that we are looking for in terms of causing cancer or being associated with increased risk for cancer. Um, and there are other mutations that don't have any impact at all, um, and they're just part of the normal human variation. Um, so when you're looking at the report, this is something that I don't think you really need to do as a patient um, standpoint, but um, you know your provider should be considering the specific mutation um, that is happening and what that impact of that mutation is on this gene, um, and particularly if you're thinking about targeted therapy. I'll put in a little plug here for our molecular tumor board. Um, so as we can do more and more testing, we have more and more genes, there's you know, literally millions of mutations to be thinking about. Um, you know, not everybody is going to be able to stay on top of all of that information. So um, if your providers have questions, we do have a molecular tumor board here at Johns Hopkins where we review these cases um, and we make recommendations. We determine whether or not these mutations are significant. All right, so that is um, the testing. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the new targeted therapies that have come on the market. Um, so I'm gonna lump this by mutation. Um, so the first one is a somatic ESR1 mutation. So these are uh, mutations in the tumor in the ESR1 gene. This is the estrogen receptor gene. Uh, so this is really exciting because this approval just came through, I think, two months ago, um, and this is for a drug called Alicestrant or, or Surdu. Um, this is a selective estrogen receptor degrader. It's an oral pill, um, and it is now approved in estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer in the second line for patients who have ESR1 mutations. And this was the example that I was showing earlier where ESR1 mutations may develop after exposure to aromatase inhibitors. So this is a case where liquid biopsy is really helpful um, for uh, uh, detecting the emergence of these mutations. Um, the next mutation that I wanted to talk about is PIK3CA. So this is a drug that's been around for a little bit longer. This is Alpalisib or PICRE. Um, this is approved for estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, again, in the second line or later. Um, and this is given in combination with full vestrant. And so um, this is an example where there's um, many, many different mutations that can occur in PIK3CA. Um, but there is actually only a handful of mutations that are uh, specifically indicated for alpalisib. So you have to make sure that the particular PIK3CA mutation is one that is indicated for alpalisib. There are a bunch of new PIK3CA targeting uh, drugs coming down the pipeline. I was just at AACR um, last week, and we were talking about some of these new drugs. So they're going to be targeting other different mutations in the PIK3CA gene. So lots of exciting work um, coming, but uh, right now Alpalisib is the one that is available. Um, and then going on to some mutations that can occur in the germline setting. So you can see germline or somatic mutations. So in BRCA1, BRCA2, or PALB2. Um, and these three uh, genes um, increase your sensitivity to uh, PARP inhibitors. Um, so the primary one that's indicated in this is Olaparib, um, which is indicated for any subtype of metastatic breast cancer, or Talizoparib is another um, PARP inhibitor in that class. 
And then finally, just recently added to the NCCN guidelines um, is for somatic mutations in HER2. So this is different than being HER2 positive, where you have increased expression of the HER2 protein. These are actual mutations in the HER2 gene. So these are typically HER2 negative um, patients. Um, and that is for the use of neratinib, which is a HER2 targeting tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, given with full vestrant for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. Um, so lots of targeted options. We'll say there's a lot more things that are coming down the line. So you may have heard about the Capitello trial, which was looking at the drug Capivacertib, which is an AKT um, inhibitor. Um, this is going to be targeting different mutations in the AKT pathway. Um, we have Aurora kinase inhibitors coming out. We have a bunch more uh, ESR1 targeting drugs coming out. So I think this is just going to become more and more part of our everyday practice. We're going to be having to get this sequencing done um, and then interpreting these results. Um, and then just to switch gears now a little bit to talk about some new technologies on the horizon. I think there's a lot of interest in the use of liquid biopsy for cancer screening or for early detection. Right now for breast cancer, we have mam uh, mammography, which is the, the standard practice um, but the question, and which does really well um, at early detection of breast cancer, but uh, it overdiagnoses some women have, you know, abnormal mammogram findings that don't turn out to be cancer um, and underdiagnoses some other women. We have women who have normal mammograms and then are diagnosed with cancer, you know, in between their mammograms. So we're trying to figure out, can we use liquid biopsy to help augment mammogram um, to better uh, detect breast cancer? Um, so the idea here is that this could be used potentially alone or else in combination with other screening modalities such as colonoscopy for colon cancer and mammography for breast cancer. Um, there's a couple of companies that have been developed around this idea. Um, there's one that actually came out of Hopkins, which is Delphi Diagnostics. That is a company that was developed by one of my mentors, Dr. Victor Valkulescu. Um, and is located here in Baltimore, and they have a uh, liquid biopsy um, that they're offering for early detection of breast cancer uh, and of cancer in general. I think it's still uh, very much in the early phases. Um, I think we're still not quite sure exactly how to best use these results um, and how to best improve patient outcomes with these. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done here, um, but a lot of interest. And then there's a study that I'm helping to run that I wanted to mention, which is called the early study. Um, so this is for patients with, uh, with or um, without a history of breast cancer, but who are going for um, a mammogram and biopsy because they've had an abnormal mammogram. So if you have an abnormal mammogram and you're coming back for a biopsy, we're doing a liquid biopsy at the same time as your tissue biopsy, and then trying to see if we can use similar technology to what's used in the Delphi diagnostic uh, technology to try to um, determine if that mass that they're biopsying is going to be cancer or not. Um, so if that's something that you have friends who are potentially interested um, in enrolling in, um, you know, we're, we're very excited um, to be getting this study going. Um, other new technologies on the horizon, um, so this idea of using liquid biopsy guided escalation or de-escalation of treatment in the neoadjuvant and the adjuvant setting. So we know in early, uh, early stage breast cancer that some proportion of patients are going to be cured by surgery alone, and we've added more and more treatments, radiation, uh, chemotherapies, um, to try to decrease the amount of people who recur. But we know that we're over-treating some people. Some people are getting more chemotherapy than they need. They would have otherwise been cured. And we also know that we're probably also under-treating some people. So some people are at increased risk for a recurrence and we need to give them more therapy. So right now we just use clinical things for trying to, to decide you know, who's gonna get more or less um, therapy. But the idea is that you could use liquid biopsies so that if the circulating tumor DNA disappears, then it may be okay to give less treatment. Whereas if it's remaining, then that patient may need more treatment. So the, this idea of, um, really personalizing uh, the treatment that patients are getting based on their circulating tumor DNA. 
And then in the um, metastatic setting, this idea that you can use repeated liquid biopsies to guide treatment for metastatic breast cancer. So we've talked about that a little bit, particularly with ESR1 mutations, um, but there's this idea that you can use this more uh, more than just looking for those mutations to try to um, guide the treatment. So this is a, a study that I'm um, leading, which is the IMAGE2 study that's being done here at Hopkins. And this is um, getting serial liquid biopsies for patients with metastatic breast cancer um, to try to best uh, tailor uh, their treatment um, to their response. All right, so that is the end of what I had to talk about. Um, I think most importantly, I would just like to say thank you to all of the, the patients who I've had the great pleasure of taking care of and for the people who've taken the time to join us today and people who participated in this study um, studies, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you for that. That was very informative. Um, we have one excellent question. It's actually something that I wrote down. Um, is there genetic testing for secondary leukemia after breast cancer? That is a fabulous question. Um, no, not currently, um, but that is something that we are very, very interested in. Um, so when you do a liquid biopsy and you're looking at the cell-free DNA, you see the cell-free DNA from the cancer, but you can also see cell-free DNA from white blood cells and something called um, CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. These are mutations in the white blood cells, and at the time, they're not causing any clinical um, problem, but we know that CHIP is associated with an increased risk of developing leukemia. Um, and so the question is, you know, can we be monitoring these CHIP mutations with liquid biopsy um, to adjust for people's risk of developing leukemia? Should we be tailoring their chemotherapy regimens to take into account if they have an increased risk of developing leukemia? All of these things are active research questions um, that people are, are working on right now. Um, but as of right now, no, not a, not a commercially available test. And just to follow up to that, how does one know if they're at increased risk of developing leukemia after breast cancer? Another great question <laughs> that we don't have a great answer for. So we do know that there are certain CHIP mutations. So this is, again, that it's called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. These are uh, mutations in some of your white blood cells. There are certain of those CHIP mutations that seem to be associated with an increased risk of leukemia, um, and particularly in response to certain kinds of chemotherapy. So some kinds of chemotherapy increase your risk more than others. Uh, but again, it's an increased risk. It's not an absolute guarantee that you're going to get chemo or going to get leukemia or not get leukemia, and exactly how to tailor the treatment, because we obviously we have to take care of the breast cancer that you already have. So how can we safely tailor that treatment to decrease your risk of leukemia? It's still, uh, still unknown, um, but definitely an active area of research. Are there any other questions in the audience? No? Well, this has been really informative. And um, as a follow-up to this, I'm wondering, you, you made some reference to um, a couple of the studies being done at Johns Hopkins and that, you know, mm -hmm. if anybody wanted to reach out in order to see if they um, maybe can participate, um, would it be possible for me to share that with our community? Absolutely. Yep. I can send you, um, we have a flyer uh, for the early study. Um, and then for the image trial, that would be something that the um, that your treating physician would have to refer you to, but I, I can send you some information about that as well. Excellent. Well, I'm happy to say that, you know, for me, um, I was first diagnosed with breast cancer 12 years ago, and there's been so much development that it's, it gives me so much hope for the future. So I thank you so much for everything you do, all the research you do. I know you care very deeply. And so the reason we have this webinar series is so we can empower our community to learn more and be hopeful because I think there's a lot that's being done that I very much uh, applaud and appreciate. So thank you so much. I will share this recording with um, 
those on this uh, this webinar, and I will share it at large with those who could not uh, make it. And we make all of our webinars available on our YouTube channel afterwards, so I will post it there as well. So thank you so much for your time today, um, and I'll see everyone in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.